Welcome to the second Soapbox Science Sydney live online event this week. I'm Laura McCaukey and I'll be your host for this evening, collating questions and asking our speaker, Hannah Law, these questions during her talk. Before I give some background into Soapbox Science Sydney and introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands UTSC City Campus, from which we are streaming, now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. I'll start with a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during tonight's webinar, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel, and we'll ask our speaker these over the duration of their talk. You can ask questions anonymously, and also if you like a question someone else has asked and you would like it answered, then please use the upvoting tool, which is the wee thumbs up symbol next to the question itself. The session will also be recorded, but will not be recording any video or audio input from the audience. If you have any concerns or questions over this, you can contact the Soapbox team via email at soapboxsciencesydney at gmail.com. You may be wondering what Soapbox Science is, or you may have come across it in its original pre-COVID format, which is researchers standing on soapboxes wearing lab coats in very busy public places like shopping centres or Circular Quay where we had Sydney's first Soapbox Science event last year. The premise behind both the in-person and online Soapbox Science events is for the public to interact with, question and probe some of our nation's most fabulous researchers in science, technology, engineering and maths. We want these events to be as interactive as possible, so please ask questions as we go along. Our brilliant speaker tonight is Hannah Law. Hannah is in the third year of her PhD at the Kirby Research Institute, where she's studying the human immune system and how certain parts of the immune system respond to vaccination. In particular, she looks at how specific cells can form memory responses to vaccination and also their role in helping other cell groups become more efficient at responding to vaccination. I can already see the COVID vaccine questions flying into the Q&A box. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Hannah for her to tell us more. Hi everyone, um, and thanks Laura for that introduction. Um, so I want you to imagine having an entire army that's dedicated to protecting you every hour of every day. There were groups that were responsible for immediate defenses against different enemies, groups that were specialized to remember if an enemy attacked again, and even groups that were responsible for training and organizing everyone. Well, this is how our immune systems work. We have an army of cells throughout our whole bodies and some are stationed in particular parts of the body like your organs or your tissues and some are out on patrol and circulate all over. This army of cells is made up of many different types of cells that all have unique and important roles in protecting us against enemies such as bacteria and viruses like the flu. So just like in the army, uh, there are groups of cells whose main role is to immediately attack invading enemies to stop their movement throughout the body. This is called our innate immune response, which is just a fancy way of saying that we're all born with this type of army. There are groups of cells that help to alert everyone else that an attack is underway, and even special groups of cells that train to be able to recognize a second attack more quickly. This is the type of immune response that I study and that we're gonna talk about tonight, and it is called our adaptive immune response, which again is just a fancy way of saying that your immune system adapts by training to create a memory of the invading enemy. So this last group of cells are especially important because it allows, our, it allows us to train our immune systems to recognize, capture and defeat our biological enemies more quickly. The best way we can do this is by using vaccines. And vaccines can train our immune systems by showing our army of cells what the enemy or virus or bacteria looks like. So this means that while we're still healthy, our cells can spend time learning how to recognize the enemy and training to learn techniques of how to defeat it. Then when the attack does come, our cell army can more easily defend us and eliminate the invader. But there's a plot twist. There's always a plot twist. 
Our biological enemies can be stealthy and smart, and some have developed ways of camouflaging themselves. So these techniques of camouflage are called immune evasion and can come in many different forms. One example is um, containing mutations, which slightly change how they look, which is what we call antigenic drift. And this tricks our immune system into thinking that we've not seen it before. This is one form of what we call viral variation and is the case for many invading enemies, including the flu, which is one of the reasons why you need to get a flu vaccination every year. So there are two groups of cells that are important in studying vaccines and that I look at. And these include firstly, the group of cells that are specialized to remember when an enemy attacks again, and they're called your B cells. And secondly, the group that I'm mostly interested in, um, which is called the group that your helper T cells, and they're the group that's responsible for helping to train other groups of cells and improve their memory or response. So all this training, it happens in a specialized tissue in the body. It's about the size of a fingernail and it's called a lymph node. Some people know them as glands, but I like to think of them as training centers for your adaptive immune army. Cells that are out on patrol, they're circulating throughout your body. They capture the invading enemy and they take them back to the training center. This is where our B cells meet the enemy for the first time and helper T cells give the B cells instructions or directions to help them produce ammunition, which is called antibodies, to defeat the invasion. So some cells, some B cells produce antibodies right away and others continue to train, sometimes for weeks at a time, to produce antibodies that are as tailored to be as effective as possible. So even though this training can take weeks, it means that our enemy is cleared and our responder cells are as efficient as possible at identifying and defeating the enemy for next time. So that was a very, very brief introduction to the immune system and the adaptive immune system specifically. So let's see if you guys have any questions. Thanks, Hannah, for your introduction into the immune system. It really is complex and wondrous, but very confusing to us mere mortals, but you, that you gave us a really clear explanation of it. So I think that's the first time in my microbiology career I've understood some immunology. Oh, well, I'm glad some of it makes sense. <laughs> Um, we do have some questions here. Um, the first one is, how long can this training our immune system through vaccination last? Because humans are living longer now for more than 70 years on average. Do we need to get vaccinated more often throughout life? That's a, that's a really great question. And um, it always, of course, depends on what you're being vaccinated against. So there are some um, vaccines that produce what's called sterilizing immunity, which means that you're um, protected throughout your life. So that includes like polio or like the measles. Um, and then others um, produce, uh, it's not, not, it's like a functional immune immunity. So um, your antibodies that that train, um, the B cells that train to produce antibodies, they might not last such a long time. So that's when you need to get um, boosters for your vaccines. So in terms of us, um, you know, living longer and that meaning that we need to get more boosts for vaccines, um, I don't know specifically. Um, and it depends on what different, um, you know, diseases come up or enemies come up in the future, same, like, exactly like what's happening right now with COVID. So yeah, it depends on um, the enemy that you're encountering and just how effective our immune system is at training. I'm going to use my priority of being the host to ask my question. Um, so I have had my MMR vaccine oh, about five times in the last five years, but my um, immunity to German measles or rubella just doesn't go up. Why do some people not mount immune responses to vaccines? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question as well. Um, and, you know, I think it's just that um, everyone is different. So how effective you can um, produce and sustain that immunity depends from person to person. Um, and of course, you know, different um, viral strains, they, um, Sort of, if you if it's slightly different to the to another one that you have really good immunity to, it means that you know our um, 
immune system might not recognize it, so to speak. So, to speak. so yeah, it depends on the person. Um, and yeah, you just have to keep getting them, I'm afraid. I don't have, <laughs> don't have any more hope for you than that. <laughs> I'm just glad German measles isn't very prevalent um, in Australia, so I don't have to worry about it too much just now. Um, we do have a load more questions. Um, what other ways are there to train your immune system apart from vaccines or are vaccines the only way? Yeah, that's a good question. So really interestingly, um, it's actually really cool. Our immune systems do this by themselves. Um, and, you know, it, it happens again, it can be um, just training for a few days, but sometimes for weeks at a time, sometimes even months to produce um, this kind of immunity. At the moment, yeah, vaccines are the only way that we can train these our immune systems while we're still healthy. Um, and yeah, that also um, means that with vaccine-induced immunity, it's um, generally not as strong or as um, potent or like long-lasting as it would as immunity would be if you have um, had a real infection. So yeah, unfortunately, they're the only two ways that we can train our immune systems at the moment. I think I'd rather have the vaccine than have to get sick. Yeah. Um, why do we still get sick if we've had the flu vaccine? Yeah, that's um, a good question. And there are a couple of different um, reasons. One is what I mentioned just before, is that vaccine-induced immunity tends to not be um, as strong or as potent as immunity that you get from an actual infection. And um, another reason is you sort of have to think about um, the biology of it, right? So you get a vaccine in your arm, which is, um, in one way, it's good. It's close to your training centers. Some of the lymph nodes are found under your arms. So you can produce, it's easy for the um, circulating or the cells that are out on patrol to capture that enemy that's present in the vaccine and take it back to the training center and to get ourselves training. But it means that the, um, the memory responses that we do have are often deeper, deeper in our bodies, deeper in the tissues. So for um, respiratory viruses like the flu, you then have to think about where you're actually being infected. And that is your respiratory system, right? So, you know, your um, airways and your lungs. And because you have, you know, had your vaccine in your arm, you don't necessarily get those um, you know, memory responses or memory cells, they're not stationed at the site of infection. So um, even though you will um, have some sort of infection, it's likely that you will get, not likely you will get infected, but if you do get infected, it's likely that you um, will get sick. But that sickness or the um, symptoms that you have from that, that virus um, won't be as bad because you do have those memory cells that are deeper in, in your body that can react. Yeah. I didn't know any of that. I just thought it was easiest to get in your arm. I didn't know there was a reason for it. Um, somebody wants to know, what is the difference between B cells and helper T cells? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, they're both a type of white blood cell, um, but your B cells are the ones that produce the ammunition and they fight off... Um, so the ammunition or the antibodies, they will um, stick to the outside of viruses and that, or bacteria, and that will prevent them from um, entering into cells or they'll also mark them for other cells to, to eat them or to destroy them in some way. Whereas your T cells are cells that um, they, their main function, the helper T cells are your main, their main function is to help these the B cells to become as specific as possible. So um, yeah, I'll just, I spoke, speak a little bit about that in the next section. So um, stay tuned. Maybe I might be able to answer your question a bit better later on. Well, that's the perfect lead in then. You've done my job for me. Over to you, Hannah, and you can tell us a bit more. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we've spoken a little bit about what the immune system is and how we can develop memory to respond to invasion quicker. But what I do in my work goes a little more in depth than looking at the immune system or the army as a whole. So for this project, 
we're focusing on the trainer cells that are called TFH cells or your helper cells. And they are found in the lymph nodes or the training centers. When I tell people that I'm interested in these trainer cells, they often say, why are you interested in them and not the cells that are actually responding and on the front lines, so to speak? And that's a really good question. Um, it's like being interested in an Olympic athlete's trainer and not the athlete performing themselves. But the success of any athlete and any army depends on how successfully they have trained for an event. And this is where the TFH cells in our lymph nodes become key players in how effective our immune systems can respond to invasion and infection. So research in this field has shown that when a TFH cell is not working properly, the ability of our B cells to develop the correct ammunition or the correct tactics to fight off infection is severely impaired. Scientists have also shown that how much help a B cell will receive from a TFH cell directly relates to how prepared the responder is to fight infection. And all this happens inside the lymph nodes or the training centers. So we know what the, trainer, what the trainer TFH cells look like. And we know that they're really important in helping to train our B cells to produce high quality ammunition to fight off infection. And we know where to find them. So you might be thinking, well, what are you waiting for? Well, there's one major obstacle in studying these cells. And it's actually one of the things that makes them really easy to study. It's where they're found. So for all the reasons that I've spoken about tonight, our lymph nodes are really important in the immune response. So you can't just go taking them out of people. It would sort of be like asking a swimmer to train for a really big and really important race, but without a swimming pool. So we have developed a special technique, and by we, I mean my supervisors and people who have been working in my lab, um, that allows us to take a very small sample of the lymph nodes from under your arms, whilst keeping the rest of the structure intact. So in our study, participants are given the seasonal influenza vaccination in their arm, which allows for patrolling cells to capture the enemy present in the vaccine and deliver it to the lymph node. So it's here that a surrogate immune um, response happens or begins, and that allows our cells to train to more effectively um, respond if they encounter a real influenza infection. So then we use an ultrasound, like how you use to view a baby in a mum's tummy, um, to guide a very, very fine needle into the lymph node, where the cells collect inside the tube of the needle kind of like how the fluid from a drink will automatically fill half of a straw when you place it into the drink. So we then take these cells back to the lab and use different laboratory techniques to study these immune cells. So from here, we can look at if there are changes in the appearance of these TFH cells after vaccination. We can see if there's a relationship between these cells in the lymph nodes and cells that are out on patrol through the circulation. And we can even see if there are changes in the signals and directions that they're giving to our B cells. So these are some of the questions that I'm hoping to answer by the end of my PhD, but why? What's the bigger picture and why do we care? Well, some people argue that knowledge is power, and this is really the foundation of my research, much like any scientific research that goes on. And the main outcomes of this research are to better understand the role of these cells in the lymph nodes and their relationship to other important immune cells. On the other hand, some say that knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. And this is where my research sits in the bigger picture. So armed with the knowledge of how critical groups of cells in our training centers of our immune systems can respond to vaccination, and the nature of their relationships with other groups of cells, we can further investigate how to leverage these roles and, and relationships to improve our responses and hopefully apply this to different diseases and different vaccines in the future. So that's a little bit about my research. So let's see if you guys have any more questions. Thanks, Hannah. Again, you made that super easy to understand. Um, we've got quite a few questions about these lymph nodes or these training centres. 
Where exactly do you find them? You've mentioned that you get them in your armpits, but where else? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so your lymph nodes are part of what's called your lymphatic system. So one person can have hundreds of lymph nodes. So then they often come in clusters as well, which has a little bit to do with their function. Um, and the main clusters are sort of like in your neck here. So like when you go to your doctor, if they um, feel in your neck, if you have any swollen glands, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for your lymph nodes. Um, you also get them underneath your arms. These are called your auxiliary lymph nodes. You, um, another cluster is inside your um, stomach not inside the stomach, sorry, in the stomach area. <laughs> um, and uh, around, it's around one of your major article, um, arteries. And then another big um, cluster is inside, around your hips, inside the pelvis. And that's your, they're called your iliac um, lymph nodes, I believe. So they're the four main um, big clusters, yeah. Are the ones in your throat, your tonsils, or are they further down? Yeah, so you have ones that are further down. So your tonsils are also part of um, your lymphatic system. So it's your tonsils are what is called a secondary lymphoid organ, um, which is the name that you give to like your tonsils, your lymph nodes, and your spleen as well. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, why do your lymph nodes get swollen when you get sick? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's nothing to be worried about. <laughs> uh, that means that they're working. So when um, a, a cell that's out patrolling captures an invading enemy, it will take it back to the training center or the lymph node. And here is where your cells are going to start dividing. They're going to start splitting like crazy and trying to make lots and lots and lots of copies of themselves, um, particularly your B cells, so that they can, you know, um, leave the lymph node and go out to fight the infection. So that's why you often get um, enlarged lymph nodes. So yeah, they're not, it's not a bad thing. Don't be worried. But of course, you know, if you are worried, you should go see your doctor. <laughs> it's not a bad thing, but it's uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if you've had your lymph nodes removed then, like your spleen or um, during cancer treatment, does this mean you've got fewer training centers and therefore a weaker immune system? So um, it definitely means that you have fewer training centers because um, they're being removed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you um, have a weaker immune, immune system. Yeah. Well, that, that's good. So is it like your body compensates for the loss of them by the other ones working harder? Yeah, basically, you could say that, yeah. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Um, how else do viruses avoid the immune system? Um, yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, so there are sort of like two main ways. One I mentioned before is called antigenic drift, which is where you have small an accumulation of small mutations that slightly change um, the appearance. So you can, they might change like um, a particular protein that's on its surface. That means that it might interact with your cells a bit differently. Um, and the other main way is called antigenic shift, which is um, where you have major changes that um, change, really change the um, structure or the biology of the, of the virus. And that means that it often leads to um, like a new subclass. So like a new, sort of like how influenza has lots of different, you have like H1N1, H5N1 and so on and so forth. So you, that will lead to a, um, a new sort of uh, strain of the virus. Oh. Um, we're going to go back to more questions about lymph nodes. Um, do the lymph nodes have any roles other than acting as training centers? Yeah, um, so, they have two main roles. Um, one is to act as the training center and the other is to, um, it, because they're part of your lymphatic system, they, they act as a sort of like a drain or um, a filter system. And that's also why you find them clustered together because the, the lymph will flow through one lymph node and then out through into another lymphatic vessel and then into the next lymph node. And, um, 
it will filter your your lymph your lymph which is the fluid that flows through the lymphatic system um, for any waste or debris that's in your body so things like um, if cells have been destroyed um, or if there are any sort of bits of floating um, invading enemies that are there and they take them back and they get filtered through um, these lymph node sort of um, aggregations, I guess, or lymph node clusters. Wow. So they're, they're the two lymph make. nodes sound very, very important. They sound like they're doing a lot of very useful jobs. Yeah. Um, one last question about lymph nodes before we move on. What happens when your lymph, lymph nodes aren't working properly? Yeah, that's a um, good question. I think you can have a, there's a few different things that can happen. Um, you might not generate the, um, you might not generate the correct um, or the most high quality um, cells, B cells that can make really good antibodies. So you might not have um, really, really good um, Im immune responses to certain um, invading enemies. That's not to say that you won't have any. Um, things that can also happen if your um, like lymph nodes aren't working properly is if they sort of go out of control and they start, um, your cells start proliferating like crazy and they can't stop. And that's when you have things like um, cancers in your lymph nodes and things like that. So there are a few different things that can happen. Yeah. So they're really important little, even though they're really tiny, they have very important roles. Excellent. Um, well, in terms of time, I want to hear a bit more about your research. Um, so I'll hand back over to you and we can have another Q&A in a few minutes. So we've spoken um, about the concepts of the immune system and immune responses and a little bit about the TFH cells that I'm interested in. But what exactly do I do all day? And I get asked that a lot and not just from my bosses. Um, so I'm a, I'm a lab-based scientist, which means that every day I go to work and I wear a lab coat. It's not as fancy as this one, um, but it's a nice blue one. And I wear safety glasses like these ones. And I not, wear not just one, but two pairs of gloves. And I go into the lab to work in a sterile safety hood. Now you might have guessed, but the tools that I use the most are of course test tubes, like these ones here. And I also use pipettes, lots of different types of pipettes. So there are two main laboratory techniques that I use to study TFH cells. Um, firstly, in order to identify what the cells look like and how to measure changes in their phenotypic or their observable physical state, I use what's called flow cytometry. And flow cytometry is a technique that can detect and measure different physical and chemical characteristics of a cell. So you can also use other particles, it's not just cells. Um, but how this works is I take a really small volume of the lymph node sample and I put it into one of these um, test tubes. Then I take um, what's called a fluorescent label and I can detect that can detect specific characteristics on the surface of the cell. So here you can see we have, sorry, this is my nice home drawn um, diagram, but here you can see we have a cell, in this case it's a TFH cell, and it's expressing a number of proteins on its surface. So these little guys here. And this will allow its identification and classification into a specific cell group. Sort of like how different defense forces and sports teams have different uniforms. So here you can see that we have a um, fluorescent label, which is specific for only one of these proteins. In this case, it's the triangle shaped protein. Here is another, which is specific for only the curved shaped protein. So you can imagine that when you use a combination of these different fluorescent labels, you can identify different groups of cells and you can distinguish between many different components of the immune system. So in my case, I can identify the TFH cells and I can measure if there are changes in their physical state after influenza vaccination. So maybe they become more activated and more excited and they start expressing more of the triangle shaped protein, or maybe they start showing signs of exhaustion and death. 
and they start expressing more of the um, curve-shaped protein. So the second laboratory technique that I use is called DNA sequencing. And firstly, I use flow cytometry to identify my cells of interest. And I place a single cell, so one cell, into one of the wells in each of these plates. So then I use a pipette and I add different chemicals that cause the breakdown of the cell and allow for the creation of many copies of DNA. So DNA is the genetic material that forms the blueprints or the instructions for every cell, every organ and every tissue that make you, you. So these instructions are formed by the combination of just four letters. We have T, G, C, and A. When we say that we are performing DNA sequencing or single cell sequencing, it means that we're recording the arrangements of these four letters in each individual cell. These arrangements are then decoded to tell us the different genes that are being expressed by the cell and it also allows us to see if there are any genes that are being upregulated or downregulated in the cells after vaccination and eventually hopefully, if they're linked to improved immune responses. So we also use this DNA sequencing to try to identify if different cell groups are what we call clonally related, which means that they come from the same original cell. Sort of like how um, you and your cousins come from the same ancestors. The way we can tell if two groups of cells are related is by looking at the sequences of the T, G, C and A's in what we call a cell receptor. These receptors have the ability to not only tell us if a relationship between two groups of cells exist, but they also play important roles in how cells recognize invading enemies. So by analyzing the cell receptors instructions, we can tell whether they're related to other cell groups and if they can respond to an enemy of interest, like influenza. So if I combine all three techniques, I would be able to, one, identify if changes in the physical state of TFH cells occur after vaccination. Two, if they're expressing high levels of genes that are known to be linked to improved immune responses or known to improve help to train other responding cells. And three, if they can I already identify influenza out of the millions of possible invading enemies. So yeah, that's basically what I do every day. <laughs> I hope my supervisors are watching. Um, so I'll take, yeah, if you guys have more questions, let's have some more questions. I'm gonna start with a comment. I wish I had met you years ago and you explained immunology like this because it would have made so many more seminars during my career actually enjoyable instead of just a jumble of letters and numbers and me not paying any attention. Um, we've got loads of questions. Um, I'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I'm gonna start with, why do we give vaccines in different ways? Some are in the arm, but the polio vaccine is given orally. Yeah, that's a um, really good question. Um, so I'm going to admit, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but, and I don't know much detail, but it's often um, got to do with like how um, it might be more effective being given in a, in a specific way or in a specific place. Um, and it also might be a lot easier to be given in that, in that place. So I know as well, like, if you think about it, um, like if you get given um, a vaccine in your arm, there's often a lot less, um, you know, tissue and muscle and things that it needs to, to get through than if you got it in your bottom, for example. So some, some places or some sites um, or ways of delivery are more effective than others. And I guess it depends on, yeah, what you're being vaccinated against. I agree with some vaccines are given in a more pleasurable way. I think the polio vaccine used to be given on a sugar cube. Oh. Um, would all of the changes in the cells be the same if you were given a different vaccine or is what you've been talking about specific to just the flu vaccine? Um, 
Can you repeat that question? Sorry. Yeah, so you're talking about the, you're looking for the changes on the surface of your cells when you give oh. the flu vaccine. Is this applicable to all vaccines or is this just the flu vaccine? Um, so in every vac after every vaccine, you are going to have um, changes yet yeah, in your cells, in your cell surface proteins. So um, generally, yeah, when, well, what you would expect or intuitively, um, which I'm going to kill myself for saying that afterwards, because immunology is where intu intuition goes to die. Um, but intuitively, yeah, you would um, give a vaccine and then your cells would become more activated and more excited and they're getting ready. They want to do their job. They're getting, you know, um, ready to beat up some invading enemies. And they would be um, upregulating different proteins on their surface um, or producing different chemicals um, like cytokines or chemokines that will take them to different parts of the body, depending on where they're, um, where they're needed. So yeah, it happens in every, every single vaccine, um, uh, not just the flu vaccine, but I'm yeah, looking at the flu vaccine um, one, because it's interesting, and two, because it's a, a nice vaccine. It's easy to give to people who are participating in the study, um, and there's not many um, side effects, which is always nice. <laughs> um, we've got a COVID question. I thought there would be more, but um, is antigenic shift that you mentioned, why COVID is spread so much around the world? Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily think so, because... Um, Antigenic, there's no real evidence of antigenic shift in, in the coronavirus in SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes um, COVID-19. Um, it seems that uh, from you know, what I've read and what I understand that um, the virus that we have circulating today is still very similar to the virus that originated um, back last year. But I think um, how, it, how far and how wide it has spread has um, to do with more things like it's six times more infectious and deadly than the normal flu. And I think it also has to do with things like, um, you know, normal things like to do with modernity. So how um, today it's much easier and much more likely that you get on a plane and you go to another country and you go visit people. And um, yeah, so I think it's, um, slightly more to do with those kind of things. But, you know, there, there's always those um, mutations that happen and that could be at play underway. So I will actually mention that um, there's a really good um, ABC podcast called Coronacast. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it, but it's great. Um, I think it's Tegan Taylor and Dr. Norman Swan. They're the hosts and they're amazing. They will probably have an, um, an episode of the podcast that speaks about that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, check it out if, um, if that's your kind of thing. I think you can get it. You can even listen to it on, their, on the ABC website. So yeah, they might have more information, sorry. <laughs> I agree with that. I listened to Coronacast on my walk to work um, and it is very good because they're very topical. They answer the questions that are in the news at that point. Definitely, um, yeah. So we've got a question from Aaron. Um, he says, vaccines have been amazing to reduce effects of some um, diseases. His first question, and he has two, is does vaccination produce a stronger and or longer lasting immunity compared to exposure to the virus or the bacteria itself? Yeah, so um, it's actually the opposite. So, um, like I said, you know, immunology is where intuition goes to die. Everything that you think would make sense or that would, um, you know, actually how you think it's going to go, it usually goes the opposite, which um, means that, yeah, you know, vaccine-induced immunity does tend to be um, weaker than um, when you actually get infected with um, an invading enemy. Um, naturally. And I think that's, you know, to do with how the different types of vaccines, because you're not just, we can't just inject you with the, with the virus or the bacteria. So we have to come up with different and creative ways of how to make it less potent and um, yeah, like less, less virulent, I guess it would be the word for viruses. Yeah, there's now a shift. There used to be a lot more live vaccines than you get now. We're moving away from the live vaccines more into the 
um, modern technology version of vaccines. Yeah, yeah. And that's also to do with um, like bad side effects as well. So um, yeah, you want to try to reduce the side effects and boost the, the immunity, but sometimes it's not, not so effective. So Aaron's second part of his question then, he says, is modern society becoming more reliant on acquired immunity through vaccination? And compared, and are therefore becoming more and more scared to be exposed to pathogens that will potentially build up the immune system in a stronger, more natural basis. So I, I guess what he's saying is, do you think people are becoming too reliant on vaccines? Um, I, I don't think so. I'm obviously a big fan of vaccines. <laughs> um, I, work, I work with them and I, I study how they um, produce immune responses. But I, I don't think so. I think that um, there are definitely a lot more vaccines around and there are vaccines that you have to have nowadays because we have the technology to develop, the, to develop them and we have the infrastructure and the manufacturing abilities to make them on such a large scale. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a positive thing. Um, even though, yeah, you have to get quite a few of them, a lot of them protect against really quite nasty and life-threatening diseases. Um, yeah, which I think is a good thing, particularly for at-risk populations. So like, you know, it's the bell curve of age, they say, you know, the people who are at risk are usually um, very young or very old. So um, yeah, I don't think necessarily reliant, but um, yeah, I think maybe like using it as a tool would be how I would think of it. And the other upside of vaccines is you get a lollipop and a sticker when you get one. Yeah. Um, do the proteins on the surface of cells change after someone has had a vaccine? I know you've alluded to it. Have you found any specific changes or would that be giving away the game before you publish? Oh, no. Um, so we, we have seen, um, definitely we have seen some changes. And like I said before, a lot of them are sort of like activation markers. But um, I will say that there is one one flaw with flow cytometry um, and that is that you're limited by the number of fluorescent labels that you can put onto a cell because um, each of those fluorescent labels has an emission spectra so it emits some light that the flow cytometer then captures and when you have too many of those um, they start to overlap and it kind of gets confused of like what protein or what um what what marker it's coming from but that's also another reason why we're doing the single cell sequencing it means that we can look for um the uh like genetic instructions that code for those um protein expression so um and we have seen some really really interesting um data from that um, but yeah, I'm going to have to leave it there. I don't want my supervisor to kill me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you can't give the game away until you publish. Um, oh my God, there's so many questions and we could literally sit here all night talking to you, um, but we're running out of time. So my last question to you and give us a very quick answer is why do you love science and what made you want to be a scientist? Um, oh God, that's a good question. I ask myself this a lot considering I'm a PhD student, um, but I don't, I, I don't think I ever really wanted to be a scientist. Um, science wasn't particularly cool when I was at school, but um, the more I think about it, you know, we're sitting here right now and we all feel perfectly normal. We're all um, just going about our day, you know, having a conversation, but on the inside, there are cells that are dividing. Half of your immune system is probably kicking off because it thinks it's um, being invaded by something. The other half of the immune system is trying to calm that half down. And then you've got cells that are like on this express highway through your blood, trying to get to different places and blow, blow other things up. And I think in the end, I just thought, God, this is so cool. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to know more about, um, more about your whole body? And I think research particularly is really cool because um, the immune system is so complicated and I take kind of um, solace in the fact that like half the time I don't really know what's going on and that's okay because science and research 
you ask questions and you have to find the answers and you, you, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it does work. And half the time you don't know why it has worked and you've got to figure that out too, but it's like a real challenge every day. So yeah, I think they're the two main reasons. That was the perfect summation of what research is. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes you've got no idea whether it's worked or it hasn't worked. Yeah. I love it. Um, like I said, there's so many questions, but we just don't have time to go over them all. Um, so thank you, Hannah. You were absolutely brilliant at bringing such a complex topic to a level where we could all understand it. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended and asked questions. If you want to watch this talk again, or you know someone who would have enjoyed it, and I'm sure you'll know many people who would have enjoyed this talk, then we'll be posting it on our website in the next few weeks. You'll also receive a post-event email in the next 24 hours with an evaluation survey. Um, please fill this out as it helps us to gauge the success of our events and make improvements for next year. We couldn't run the event without our amazing sponsors, so I'd like to thank the University of Technology Sydney, Excite on Science, Equus, and the University of Wollongong for their continued support. We have so many more great talks lined up tonight, starting with Dr. Jodie Morgan in 15 minutes, who will be talking about the controversial topic of pill testing and why it's important. You can join all of these talks from the link you're on now, or you can find more information on our website, soapboxsciencesydney.com. Thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you all at our next talk.